which, according to the Roman calendar at the time, was the date of the all-important winter solstice. Fifty years later, the Emperor Aurelian, whose patron god was Sol, one of the various sun gods hanging around at the time, popularized the feast and made it an empire-wide holiday. Twenty-odd years after Aurelian, Constantine came along, and I think that we all know what happened next. Seized with either a mystical vision of Christ, or a rather practical understanding that Christian bureaucrats were the only ones who could be trusted with the imperial treasury, Constantine officially ended the persecution of Christians, and on his deathbed converted himself and the empire to Christianity. In the beginning of the Christian era, the leaders of the church attempted to stamp out the old pagan holidays, but ran into a great deal of resistance from the citizens of Rome, who continued to follow their old holiday calendar, holding fast to Sol Invictus in particular. The church elders, realizing they were fighting a losing battle, changed their strategy, and rather than attempting to stamp out the pagan holidays, simply co-opted them and refashioned them as Christian celebrations. The first official connections between Christmas and December 25th began to appear around 330 to 350 AD. Jesus was often depicted during these years with a radiating solar crown and was often used interchangeably with the various pagan solar deities by a citizen body transitioning between religions. By 400, December 25th was firmly established as a celebration of the birth of Jesus and all mention of the old gods was gone. As the empire fell, taking the last vestiges of paganism with it, Roman Catholicism stood as the last bulwark of civilization, and despite the many past claims by other deities to December 25th and the winter solstice, it was now a date for Jesus and Jesus alone. Though the importance of Christmas Day itself as a holiday has waxed and waned over the years, it was always considered the birthday of Jesus, just as it is today when, as a holiday, it now dominates the Christian holiday calendar. So there you have it. For those of you who are celebrating Christmas, remember that when you sit down and exchange presents beneath the tree on December 25th, even though you may not be in Rome, you are doing exactly as the Romans did. As I mentioned at the end of last week, the show will be on hiatus next week as I am traveling for the holidays. But when I return, I hope to bring back with me a fancy new hosting server. As many of you have noted with frustration over the last few weeks, there have been many problems downloading episodes. At first, I didn't quite know what the problem was, but it dawned on me that the thousands and thousands of download requests were overwhelming my poor little free hosting account. When I started the history of Rome, I never imagined I would need more than hobbyist grade hosting. But the audience has now officially outgrown the venue, and I plan on spending a good chunk of my downtime getting all the bugs worked out of what I hope to be a server with more than enough bandwidth to accommodate everyone out there now and anyone who wants to hop on board in the future. Hopefully fully upgraded so we can launch unobstructed into the Punic Wars, by far Rome's greatest test and a time of very real peril and then begin to trace the long, slow decline of the Republic until the whirlpool begins to suck furiously downward in the middle of the first century BC. Until then, I wish you all a happy feast of the unconquered sun. of Rome. Episode 19, Prelude to the First Punic War. When we last left the Romans, they had driven King Pyrrhus back to Greece and secured complete control of the Italian peninsula. As you may recall, Pyrrhus, exhausted from his battles with the Romans, had briefly moved his army to Sicily, where he attempted to establish a kingdom for himself. He found allies among the Greek colonies on the eastern half of the island, but found enemies amongst the Carthaginians who had settled the western half. Pyrrhus had been successful in Sicily, but was never able to completely dislodge the Carthaginians from the island. He had every intention of widening his war by invading Africa, but
but a near revolt by his Sicilian Greek allies caused him to instead abandon Sicily altogether. As he sailed away, Pyrrhus made a prescient comment, the veracity of which is dubious, like every other direct quote from the ancient world, but is worth relaying. The Greek king, a veteran of the post-Alexandrian dynastic struggles of the eastern Mediterranean, knew an inevitable great power confrontation when he saw one. Sicily lay equidistant between Rome and Carthage, and was too rich not to be coveted by both. So, while watching the island recede in the distance, he said, What a field we are leaving for the Romans and Carthaginians to exercise their arms. Ten years after sailing from Italy for good, Pyrrhus's prediction bore out, and the two great powers, Rome and Carthage, were at war in Sicily. But before we get too far into this, we should address the question of who the Carthaginians were, and why we call their long struggle with Rome the Punic Wars, and not something easier to remember, like, I don't know, the Carthaginian Wars, like we do with the Samnite Wars, and the Latin War, and the Macedonian Wars, which you can tell just by looking at the name, were fought against the Samnites, and the Latins, and the Macedonians. To start with the obvious, the Carthaginians come from Carthage, a city on the north coast of Africa near modern-day Tunis. They were primarily a trade-based empire, and by the time the Punic Wars rolled around, they were the leading economic power in the western Mediterranean. Carthage was founded around 800 BC by Phoenician settlers. The word Punic is a derivative of the Latin word for Phoenician, and it's what the Romans themselves called the Carthaginians. So today, we learn about the Punic Wars rather than the Carthaginian Wars. The Phoenicians were the strongest maritime power of their day, and are remembered most of all for providing one of the first written alphabets in history. They spread their influence across the Mediterranean by establishing a series of autonomous colonies from modern Lebanon to the Straits of Gibraltar. Any sense of political solidarity between the new cities quickly vanished, but economically they formed the backbone of a new trans-Mediterranean trade network that persists even to this day. In the western Mediterranean, Carthage soon became the richest city, owing to its favorable geographic position located along the narrow strait between Africa and Sicily. Essentially, to get from here to there in the Mediterranean, you had to sail right by Carthage, so it quickly became a hub of commercial activity and rich as a result. Politically, the Carthaginian government was a mixed oligarchy. There was a people's assembly, but it was mostly ceremonial and rarely called upon to make important decisions. The real power lay in the Senate, a body made up of the richest families in Carthage. And the real, real power lay with a council of a hundred within the Senate made up of the richest and most distinguished senators. The Senate elected the chief executive of Carthage, the Suffet, who served annually with minimal constraints on power. The only aspect of Carthaginian life the Suffet did not control was, interestingly, the army, which was left to a professional corps of generals. This is obviously a marked contrast to the Romans, who elected their executives primarily to lead their armies, with every other function serving almost as an afterthought. The other major contrast between the Romans and Carthaginians politically was that the Carthaginians did not suffer the kind of class conflict that forever plagued Rome. Access to the aristocracy, and therefore power, was based entirely on wealth. This makes sense given the primarily commercial focus of their empire. If you were poor and made yourself rich, you were invited into the Senate. And if you were rich and lost all your money, you were kicked out. It was pretty much that simple. It is for this reason that the People's Assembly in Carthage did not have nearly the clout that its corollary in Rome did. There was no lingering discrimination of new wealth by old families, so there was no real sense of disenfranchisement by men with money who would have otherwise driven democratic political reform. The way to get ahead in Carthage was to make money. Nobody cared if you made it last week or ten generations back. And if you didn't have money, there wasn't a whole lot you could do to change the system. All of this contrasted with the political history of Rome, and it left the two empires with very different worldviews. But this contrast was nothing compared to their views on the role of the armed forces. The Roman legions were made of Roman citizens and led by Roman citizens. Military service was obligatory in Rome, 
and the most important contribution to civil society a citizen could make. Carthage, however, had no such tradition. Led primarily by businessmen and not warriors, the Carthaginians contracted out the work and hired mercenaries to fight their wars for them. There was a small contingent of professional Carthaginian soldiers who led by Numidian cavalry, Spanish infantry, and Balearic slingers, all paid for out of the great Carthaginian treasury. There are more than a few who argue that the distinction between the citizen army of Rome and the mercenary army of Carthage was the deciding factor in the wars between these two otherwise equal powers. This is probably an oversimplification, but the distinction should be kept in mind as we go forward. Now historians hate to talk about inevitabilities and consider it an insult when anyone starts talking about how this or that historical event was destined to occur, and the Punic Wars are no different. It is easy to say in passing that the conflict between Rome and Carthage was inevitable and simply move on, but things are never so easy. There are many, many steps on the path to war, and if either Rome or Carthage had acted differently at any one of those steps, they may have indeed avoided the armed conflict that embroiled them for so long. But in the end, come on, let's face it, a war between them was inevitable. They were two economic and political powerhouses whose territorial boundaries bordered one another. What did you think was going to happen? When Pyrrhus was driven from Italy, and the Romans finally held the peninsula free and clear, the countdown was on for a war between Rome and Carthage. The only thing missing was a catalyst, that minor event in that insignificant place that has been starting great power wars for millennia, from the revolt in Epidomnus to the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo. In the case of the Punic Wars, it was the situation in the small Sicilian city of Masana, present-day Messina, that sealed the deal. The backstory to that situation is that a group of mercenaries from Campania, called the Mamertines, had been hired by Agathocles, the king of Syracuse, to fight his war with the Carthaginians for control of Sicily between 315 and 305 BC. A stalemate peace had been reached by 300 that divided the island between Greek and Carthaginian interests, with Masana ceded to Carthage. When Agathocles died in 289 BC, his Italian mercenaries were left unpaid and unemployed. Never a good combination. The mercenaries took a shine to Masana and decided to seize control of the city for themselves and see if anyone would stop them. Masana lay on the east coast of the island, and the Carthaginian garrison was not large or easily supplied. So when the Mamertines overran the city, the Carthaginians could only watch helplessly. The Mamertines held the city for a decade or so, living fat off the land, but knowing they were in a precarious situation, joined in the call for Pyrrhus to come to the island and drive the Carthaginians out once and for all in 278 BC. When the Greek king's rule began to reek of tyranny, the Mamertines then joined in the subsequent call for Pyrrhus to please go back where he came from. Over the course of the next decade, the major shift in Sicilian power politics was the rise of Hiero in Syracuse and his ambition to control the whole island. In the Department of Strange Bedfellows, the rise of Hiero threatened both the Mamertines and the Carthaginians, so, in 265 BC, the Mamertines formally requested a Carthaginian garrison for their city to help them fight off Hiero, and the request was granted. But the Mamertines, apparently the most fickle ruling class in history, immediately regretted inviting the Carthaginians in and cast about for someone to help them drive out their new allies. There was no one in Sicily who could help them, 